as, as I was introduced, thank you for the, very much for the introduction. Uh, my name is Jonas Eliasson. I'm, uh, well, I've, I've, I have various uh, uh, responsibilities actually. Perhaps the most relevant right, my, right now is that I'm professor of transport systems at Linköping University. And in addition to the things that were mentioned, I'm one of the persons mostly involved in those, uh, in especially the, the Stockholm congestion pricing scheme. The congestion charge in Stockholm, they were introduced back in 2006 and the planning for them began in 2003 and I was involved right from the start. And that means that my sort of take on this is coming from a transport economics perspective where the default suggestion would be to use road taxation and road user charges to internalize external costs. But then on the other hand, when you do this in practice, you have to weigh this against uh, practical considerations, especially the system costs. So what I'll do now is that I, I will present things that I think that you need to think about when you are discussing uh, any kind of especially differentiated distance-based road tax or road user charge. I'll, I'll use the terms taxes and charges and so um, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, interchangeably, so I, I, I won't make a particular distinction between those. Anyway, so there are basically two different reasons for taxing or charging road transport. One is obviously then to internalize external effects, things like emissions and wear and tear and noise and uh, external accident costs and so on. And the other one being uh, as some kind of tax source to fund public spending. It could be on infrastructure or, or it could be on something else. And what considerations lie at the forefront of the analysis that differs depending on the purpose of the taxes. Different aspects of this are um, diff are um, important to a differing degree, depending on, on what the primary purpose is. Namely, so th this will become clearer as I go along, I hope. If you are, if the primary purpose is to internalize external effects, then the most important things to consider are first, obviously, the size of the unpriced externalities. If they are large, they are, generally speaking, this is probably a good idea. Um, and also, if the price elasticity is high, then this turn out, turns out to be a good idea because then you can um, put a relatively small price on the, on the externalities and have a big effect on the externalities. But then this has to be weighed then against, against the system costs. And generally speaking, if you want a finely differentiated uh, tax or charge, then system costs will tend to be higher compared to if you have a less, more coarsely differentiated um, tax. On the other hand, if you want to use them as a tax source, then you should be should worry about dead weight losses, uh, mainly that if you're pricing traffic, then they then less transport will be, will be carried out, and that will in some sense be uh, um, uh, a loss for society. Uh, if you're using this as a tax source, then questions about fairness and equity and distributional effects come even more at the forefront. And I will speak for some time in a little while about why this is even more important when you are using road, um, road transport as mainly a tax source as opposed to uh, as a way to internalize uh, external effects. And of course, then system costs. But the comparison between the system costs also becomes slightly different because the, you have other alternatives to collect public funds than just uh, taxing road transport. One thing to note right from the outset is that a high price elasticity is a good thing when you're internalizing external effects because then you will have a large effect on um, externalities from a small tax. But it's actually a bad thing when you're after collecting revenues because the dead weight loss will be large compared to the revenues that you get. So uh, and this, is, this is one particular thing where, um, where the analysis will be different depending on what your purpose is of, of taxing road transport. Well, uh, very short crash course in transport economics. These are the net social benefits of an internalizing tax. Highly simple. Well, actually not so highly simplified, but, but uh, I, I just skip the, the necessary assumptions for this. But well, this is basically how we think about it. So the net benefits of an internalizing tax is roughly the difference between the externalities minus the tax that you're introducing, multiplied by the traffic reduction that you're getting, minus the system costs. And this means first that the revenues that you get, they really don't enter the picture. They are just a transfer between the road transport collective 
and the public funds. Uh, and, and then the government or the equivalent of the, of the government, maybe the region or something, they decide how to spend these things. So these are the, the revenues. They are, of course, important for the political analysis, but in net social benefits uh, terms, they are just a transfer between different uh, paying and beneficiary collective. There is also this discussion about the uh, possible double dividend if revenues are used to lower distortionary taxes. I won't say so much about this, but this is actually, actually very relevant. I'll return to this a little bit when I talk about distribution profiles. Um, one thing that to note is that traffic reduction, or when, as it's sometimes called the modal shift, that's not a benefit in itself. Now, this is a common uh, source of confusion. And, 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 the, and the reason for this is that uh, the, the net benefit that you're creating is actually the traffic reduction minus how large the externalities are, uh, minus the tax, as you see from the equation up there. And this matters between because externalities, they vary a lot between different kinds of situations. Uh, for example, if you think about uh, um, a large urban area, you have lots of people being exposed to bad air quality. You probably also have a lot of congestion. So externalities will tend to be very high. But if you think about, for example, a passenger car, uh, electric, driving in a rural area, not a, lot, not, not a lot of congestion, not a lot of people exposed to noise and so on then externalities will tend to be very low. And that means that just counting things like traffic reduction, that will, lead, that, that will not be enough for the analysis. So, the, the, so the, uh, what you really need to think about is the difference between the externalities minus the tax and multiplied by traffic reduction. And that also means that if you have a large traffic reduction, you will get high net benefits and so on. It's also the case that if the tax happens to be larger than the externalities, then you are overtaxing traffic. And that means that and that will then lead to a welfare loss. And this also matters because if, um, since externalities, they typically vary a lot between situations and between types of vehicle. And that means that in practice, some of the traffic will always be overtaxed while some will, will be undertaxed just because of the fact that externalities vary between situations. And in practice, you need to find a real system that, that applies sort of a good enough differentiation of this tax where total benefits are larger than total welfare losses. And as I mentioned earlier, the finer you want your differentiation of the, uh, of the tax, this will tend to create higher system costs. Things like um, uh, um, uh, odometer readings, for example, or vignettes where you just pay a fixed sum to, to use the root base. These are typically rather um, uh, cheap to, to have, whereas if you have a very finely tuned uh, nationwide road user charge, for example, that will tend to lead to much higher system costs, both in terms of investments and also in terms of enforcement. I will, I will return to this. Now, a good example, well, I, I happen to be involved in this myself, but it's, I mean, the Stockholm congestion pricing system is generally seen as a successful example of how you can introduce road use for charging in practice. And the reason why the Stockholm congestion pricing is a successful example depends on three things. First is that the price elasticity of the traffic that was charged turned out to be very high. Uh, initially, the, I mean, the, the effect has actually grown over time, but even the initial effect was roughly 20% less traffic crossings across the cordon during the charged hours and on this charge link, which, which was the, main, uh, the, the uh, most heavily congested links. The second reason is that the externalities were very large, mainly congestion, but also things like emissions, for example, but mainly congestion. And then the third thing, the system costs were relatively low. It was still a rather expensive system, but both the investment and especially the operation costs turned out to be actually slightly lower than we thought when we planned this. And just to give you an indication of, of the size of the benefits, uh, these are yearly benefits. They are roughly around 60 million euros per year. Uh, and then the the product of the unpriced externalities before the congestion then uh, before the congestion pricing system times the traffic reduction is in the, it, it's somewhere around uh, 80 million euros per year and while the system costs if you annualize the investment cost and then add the operation cost we're talking about a magnitude of 20 million euros per year something like that so so that and that's really the reason um, why, why the Stockholm congestion pricing turned out to be a successful system. If any of the three bullet points above had not been there, we wouldn't have a very large net benefit. And, 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 that, and that's really the reason, well, that's really the way that, that you have to think uh, when you're evaluating a proposal for any kind of internalizing uh, transport tax. So 
if we then are talking about nationwide road user charging, well, let's separate this into passenger cars and heavy goods vehicles. If we talk about passenger cars, generally speaking, if we're talking about nationwide, they have a rather low price elasticity on average. The, the, the price elasticity for, for passenger cars is typically something like minus 0.3 or maybe minus 0.2 or minus 0.4 something. But this varies really a lot. It's very situation specific. So if you're looking at, for example, uh, in urban areas where you have good public transport and where maybe also people can take other routes or maybe change their departure time, uh, the price elasticity can be much higher. But if you're looking at rural areas, for example, the price, the price elasticity will be much lower. On average, passenger cars, if they are electric, cause rather small externalities. I'll, and I'll show you a figure about this, but the variation is very high. If you are looking at passenger cars in congested areas, for example, the, the externality can be very high, but on average, they are rather small. If you want a nationwide differentiated road user charging scheme for passenger cars, you are looking at very, very large system costs. This is if you don't want differentiation, then, then it's, it, it's not a thing. But the thing is that since externalities vary so much, then you are looking at some, something where you are underpricing some traffic and really overpricing some other traffic. Trucks on the other hand, or heavy goods vehicles, they tend to have a very low price elasticity. And then of course this varies, but generally speaking, it's rather low. On the other hand, their externalities can be very high. But, on, but then uh, finally then, if you want differentiated charges, the system costs can be maybe not very large, but still large. And I'll show you some, some magnitudes about that as well. So road traffic externalities, these are average figures in Sweden. Uh, and these are in Swedish crowns per kilometer. Uh, 10 Swedish crowns is roughly um, one euro. So if you, uh, you, you, can, you can read this table in terms of uh, euro cents per 10 kilometers. Uh, well, uh, I mean, uh, euros per 10 kilometers. Um, roughly speaking, if you're looking at passenger cars, the main externality is carbon emission. And the other ones are on average small. These are things like wear and tear and external accident costs, other emissions, noise and so on. And this is because Swedish is a re relatively uh, sparsely populated uh, country. So if you're looking at the externalities within urban areas, figures are much different. But, but the, the absolute majority of passenger car traffic in Sweden is actually outside urban areas. And this means that, that the externality on average, if you exclude carbon emissions, that is, you have, if you're essentially looking at, um, at uh, electric cars, uh, then then they, are, then they are much smaller. Trucks, on the other hand, especially trucks with a trailer, uh, especially if they, are, if, if they are driven on diesel, they are much, much higher. The dominating part here, apart from the carbon emissions, which I'll return to later, is actually the wear and tear costs. And wear and tear costs are high, especially if you're looking at uh, heavy goods uh, um, vehicles with trailers on them. The main part of them, that comes from uh, um, trucks running on relatively small rural roads because they are not really built for, for very heavy traffic so they are they are they are, they are wearing a lot of uh, on the roads and then you have uh, other emissions and, and, and noise as well and as you can see uh, if you're looking at uh, the the current uh, taxation uh, passenger cars in sweden is actually a bit overtaxed uh, whereas um, heavy goods vehicles are a bit undertaxed on average but as i said earlier externalities vary a lot Turning then to system costs for differentiated road traffic. Well, as I said, externalities, they vary a lot. So if you want to internalize things, you really need a differentiated internalizing tax. It can't be just based on total distances. And this is re really because externalities vary so much. That means that odometer readings or vignettes, that is that you pay for some kind of fixed sum to, 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 to run your car or, or, or truck on, on the, on the road transport system, uh, they are not really enough to have an efficient or even effective internalization of, of externalities. Now, if you want to differentiate the tax, that to some extent will, requ will require four things. You need some kind of installment in the vehicles. You need a control system that checks that people have actually uh, installed something in their vehicles and that's actually turned on, that not people have tampered with it. You need a system for payment collection and you also need a, a way to enforce this, that is that making sure that people actually pay uh, what they're supposed to pay. And this is true even if vehicles already have some technology installed, because even if they have for example, GPS or some kind of um, uh, uh, transmitter installed, uh, which is typically the case in new cars and even more so in trucks, you still need to, in to do something, you need to, to control and all actually install and actually do something in the vehicle to make sure that, you, that, that it's transmitting the, um, the right thing. Uh, 
you can't. Uh, um, um, if, 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 I mean, if it's cheaper, obviously, if they have all some technology installed, you, need, you still need to do something. Now, this is also different than what drives the cost. If you have many vehicles, then the installment part will be expensive. Uh, but if you are, for example, so if you are looking at installing everything, uh, something in each vehicle, even passenger cars uh, uh, in, in a country, that will be much more expensive. But if you're only looking at, for example, the heaviest trucks, then the installment in the vehicles will tend to be less expensive. So it depends on, on how many vehicles you're looking at. It also depends on how many users you have, because if you have many users, then you collection and payment, I mean, the, the payment collection and also the enforcement system will tend to be more expensive. And also if you're looking at the large networks, for, say for example, something covering the whole country, then the control mechanism will tend to be much more expensive. Now, some magnitudes then. Uh, the Stockholm and the, and the Gothenburg congestion pricing schemes, they are passage-based charging schemes. So they work with only having automatic number plate recognition systems. So they only sort of recognize the number plate of vehicles running by. They don't need vehicle installments. And since these, these are essentially cordon based, it's not, well, it's not strictly speaking cordons, it's like cordons with some extra passages charged as well. But let's, let's think of them as almost cordons. That means that we are charging only a relatively small number of links. Um, on the other hand, there are many users. I mean, the number of users sometimes being charged is in, we're, 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 we're at least talking about millions of vehicles, maybe, maybe a couple of millions actually. But since we have a very effective vehicle registry, and since we can piggyback on the tax collection system, that keeps both collections costs and also enforcement costs down. So that means that the, the, the the operation cost and the investment cost, well, the operation cost is roughly 10 million per year or something. And then comes the annualized investment cost on top of that. This can then be compared to a proposal for a Swedish truck road uh, um, tax system, which will then be differentiated with the, it was proposed to be anyway. The investment cost is much, much higher, as you can see, and the operation cost is also much higher. This can then be compared to the total external cost for all heavy vehicles in Sweden, which is in the vicinity of 2000 million euros per year. But then on the other hand, since not of all of this will go away due to the relatively low price elasticity of trucks, the actual benefit of uh, reduced external costs will be much, much lower than that number, maybe, maybe a tenth, maybe 5% of that number or something like that. So common sense, if we're talking about carbon emissions, well, it should be obvious that the most, that they, they, they can essentially be perfectly internalized by just having a fuel tax, because then you can precisely uh, um, internalize the carbon emissions that people are actually causing. If you're talking about average passenger car accidents, they tend to be small, but they can be very large locally, obviously, both because of emissions and noise and, and the, uh, the, the, the negative uh, ambience that they are causing uh, in, in, in cars, I mean, in cities, but also congestion, primarily congestion. But the thing is that the cost for a nationwide system, especially for passenger cars, that tend to be or at least it very, it's very likely that it's very high. And if you think about local externalities, my view would be that it's much cheaper and easier to handle this with some kinds of passage-based charges or some kind of local regulations. I mean, things like uh, environmental zones, for example. Truck externalities, on the other hand, the heavy goods vehicles, they are really sizable. But then on the other hand, since their price elasticity tend to be rather low and the system costs tend to be rather high, the case for actually trying to reduce externalities from trucks by having um, a differentiated road user charge for them is, is probably not very rather uh, it, it probably not probably not very good, uh, mainly due to the um, to, to their price elasticity being rather low. Now, the two main components will be the external accident costs and the wear and tear costs. And since I said earlier, uh, the wear and tear costs tend to be rather local on specific urban local roads, for example. And it might be possible to look at, uh, instead of, of local charges, maybe some kind of passage-based charge where you can use automatic number plate recognition instead. And when it comes to accidents, uh, I, I don't think that, that, that we have that we use differentiated insurance policies uh, um, to the extent that that, that that would be good because they can also be uh, managed as opt-in schemes. If you want uh, a reduced uh, insurance policy, then you are then you can on your for your own money install something in your vehicle that reports to the insurance to the insurance company how you're, how you're actually driving. Now, 
the second reason for having road use taxation is using as a revenue source. As I said earlier, then you really want a low dead weight loss. And then the tables turn. If price elasticity is low, that's actually a good argument for pricing something because then you will create a small dead weight loss. And since especially heavy goods vehicles, they have a low price elasticity and passenger cars that well, they are medium sized, that actually makes it rather good tax base. The problem with this are essentially two. Both the thing that I already said, collection costs tend to be high or even very high compared to most other tax sources, because then we're not comparing to things like ANPR, that is automatic number of plates recognition, but you're comparing this to tax sources like income taxes or company profit tax or VAT. And the collection costs for such taxes, they are extremely low, extremely low. We're talking about fractions of a percent of the tax revenues, whereas the collection costs for, for, for road user charges, they are typically, well, maybe around 10% of the, of, of, of the collection or something, depending again on the differentiation. But what really comes into the foreground here are things like fairness and equity and distributional profiles, especially then compared with the alternative tax sources, things like income taxations and VAT. Uh, yo, so, and why then am I not as concerned with the distributional profile? Uh, let's see, I'll try to hide the thing up here. Let's see, hide floating meeting control. So now I can see what I'm talking about. Well, one thing to understand is that prices in an economy, in an open economy, they are usually the same for everyone. We usually pay the same price for clothing and for food and for vehicles and for fuels and so on. And, but, but since we want, actually, at least to some extent, income redistribution from the rich people to the poor people, but that's usually done and also more effectively done, actually, by, by moving money around. Things like progressive taxation and various kinds of tech cash transfer, things like uh, a transfer for, for if you're unemployed or if you're sick or if you're a student and so on. Usually. And there are exemptions for this, but usually we don't subsidize specific goods. And subsidizing road use for, for distribution profile is actually, at least my impression, my, my take on this is actually not a very good idea. Uh, usually, that is with some exceptions, we trust people just to, to decide for themselves how they should optimally allocate their money on things they need. Things like housing and food and clothes and transport and also other goods, for example. Now, there are exceptions to this, but for example, social housing is very common in some countries, actually not in Sweden, but, 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 but in other countries. And there are special cases, for, for example, to, to want to mix different income groups within the same housing area, for example. So there are cases where we actually want to subsidize specific specific goods. But I think that the proof of burden lies with them who wants to say that we really want to specific, want to subsidize some specific good rather than handing out cash transfers and using progressive taxation and then trusting people that they can themselves allocate how they want to spend their money on things that they need. Uh, let's see here. So, so internalization that's really a price correction it adjusts transport prices to what they should be so if you're uh, and, and that means that if you really want to go at the limit the, the distributional profile of an internalizing tax that's more or, less, more or less irrelevant at least in the long run now in the short run you will have transaction costs because people will have based their where they live and where they work and how many cars they have and so on based on current prices so if you suddenly introduce a large internalizing tax there will be transaction costs when people have to well maybe move or sell their cars or do something else so and these transaction costs can be substantial so you really need to take, take, take this into account. But if you're starting, if your starting point is that prices should be what they should be, you should pay the full social price for everything that you that, that you use. Then, then the distribution profile of having internal having an internalizing tax is actually not very relevant. This really changes if you're talking about road user charges as a way to collect public funds. That's a very different story. Then suddenly fairness and equity and distribution of effects are highly relevant to talk about. Usually, again, and this, this again depends on your political inclination, but usually speaking, at least in, 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 well, in, in, in most countries, 
we want at least some progressivity that is that rich contribute a higher share of their income to these public funds than poor people do and we also generally speaking want horizontal equity meaning that if you have the same income you should make the same contribution to the public funds it should not depend on your other social characteristics where you live and how old you are and whether what kind of job you have or your skin color or your sex or something else so it should only depend on things like income if we're talk about collecting public funds in general. So if we look then at the distributional profile of a kilometer tax, these are Swedish figures, but they are well roughly typical, uh, at least compared to most other countries. They are on average rather progressive. So these are then income optiles on the x-axis and how much, well, it, 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 it's, a, it's a, uh, the, the welfare loss compared to your income on the y-axis, and, and we'll just skip the, 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 the absolute numbers here. But as you can see, it really varies a lot between rural areas, the smaller cities and the large cities. But apart from that, it's progressive over the large part of the income distribution. But if the really rich people, they pay a smaller share of the income on this hypothetical kilometer tax. And this is also the case for the lowest income of time. And that mainly consists of people with very low incomes, so often people living on their parents, on their spouse, spouse or something like that. So just looking at on it like this, that you, then you can see that you have a, a decent distributional profile uh, because the rich pay on average a higher share of their income than the poor people do. But you have problems with your horizontal equity. You will pay much more if you live in a rural area than if you, in, than if you live in a large city. And this becomes even more of a problem if you're looking at the variation within each income group. And this is what, 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 what the next slide shows. This shows the share of people within each income octile who suffer a large welfare loss, paying more than 2% of their income in this hypothetical income tax. And this figure shows that the share of people who are sort of um, unfairly hurt, if I can say so, uh, on this, uh, by this uh, hypothetical income tax, that tends to be much higher in the lower income octiles. So if you, on average, poor people pay less, but the share of poor people paying a lot is actually higher in the lower income octiles. And this is true for all the, uh, um, uh, for, for, for where, wherever you live, uh, large cities and small cities and rural areas as well. So the problem is the horizontal equity, that, that some people pay a lot compared to their income, uh, even if they, on, on average, it's an almost progressive policy. Well, fairness then, the users should pay argument. Isn't it fair that rural users pay? Well, maybe. Uh, currently, it's the case that revenues from marginal cost road pricing, that is essential fuel taxes, is more than enough to cover for both maintenance and both investments. But if you have electric cars, then marginal social cost pricing will likely not cover fixed costs. So who then should cover the fixed road cost, the, the fixed costs of maintenance and so on? Isn't it fair that road users pay for roads fixed costs rather than all tax base? Well, it depends. And this is really hard to have an opinion about because it really depends on, on your political inclination. The question is, when is it reasonable at all that users pay fixed costs of anything? For example, public transport. Should it be only public transport users that pay the fixed cost of public transport? Well, in some countries, the answer is yes. In some countries, the answer is no. And the taxpayer collective pay at least the fixed cost of public transport. What about bike lanes, for example, where marginal costs are very small? What about libraries? What about opera houses or museums, for example? And if you really want to, 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 to use these arguments, should, is it really fair that road users in Stockholm not only pay the fixed costs for Stockholm roads, but also pay fixed costs for roads in northern Sweden? If we really take this, users should pay the fixed costs argument seriously. Because what we have now in Sweden, in a way, is that road users in Stockholm, they are many and they drive on a rather small net road network. So they are cross subsidizing the fixed road, fixed road costs in the northern part of Sweden, for example. And that can be seen as fair on, on, in a way. But if you really want to, to have this um, argument that users should pay the fixed cost, then delimiting what the collective that should pay for what fixed cost suddenly becomes much more problematic. This is a very political and ethical debate, but it's, I think it's good to aim for some consistency. If you argue that 
a certain collective of users should pay for their own fixed costs. Then you need to specify what the collective should be and in what cases this argument should be apl applicable. For example, if it's applicable for roads, why is it not applicable for opera houses, for example? I mean, obviously you can pay, you, you can say that this is applicable to all cases. I would have the most respect for this. You can also go the other way around and say that the government should only charge marginal costs and all fixed costs for public services should be paid by the, by the tax collective. That's actually more the case than we have, uh, um, uh, that we have currently, uh, 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 at least in Sweden. Uh, but, but, and both of these um, arguments are sort of uh, internally consistent. Uh, to, but, but I think it's important that you don't use different arguments in different circumstances. So, very tentative conclusions. If you have electric traffic, the benefits from, from reduced externalities is, in my, in my point of view, are likely to be small, especially compared to the system costs if you have a differentiated road user tax on average. And that's either because the external, externalities are small or because the price elasticity is, so it, it tends to be low for trucks. And this is also because if you have a differentiated road user tax that, use, that, that, that is uh, taken out over a large area, like the, the whole country, for example, then system costs tend to be high. On the other hand, local externalities, for example, in Stockholm or Gothenburg, they can be very substantial. But on the other hand, these are probably cheaper or easier to handle by other means than the general road user, uh, what should, it should say, general road user charge. It's, uh, it's probably easier to handle this through passage based charges or local regulations and so on. If we turn to road user tax as a source of public funds, well, as I explained, I think that the distributional profile is problematic, especially from a horizontal equity point of view. The collection costs are they, well, they tend to be high, especially if, if the tax is supposed to be differentiated. If you only have like odometer readings, then collection costs go down, go down, but it's still expensive, for example, compared to, to taxing income or taxing company profits or VATs, for example. I think that the relevance of the users should pay arguments. It's, well, at best, it's dubious. Uh, it, it depends on how you define the collective. For example, if you want cross subsidization between Stockholm road users and, uh, and uh, uh, road users in the northern part of Sweden, for example. Personally, I think that uh, I think that it's actually fair to have some redistribution within the country as well. But that's really a really political point of view, not a really efficiency or effectiveness or transfer economics point of view. So final caveat, these conclusions are very situation specific and policy specific. It depends on the exact design of the policy that you're looking at. But I think that we as transport engineers and transport economists, we should not, not just run into this sort of the standard argument that taxing road user charging is always positive because it, because it depends on how we design the system, both the costs and the benefits that they will bring. And that's are my conclusions. Thank you very much.